What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your man's Nicholas. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. Today's video, we are breaking down the top rookies for 2019 fantasy football, more specifically, the top rookie running backs. We are back in beautiful Brooklyn. You know, we headed down to uh, Nashville for the draft last weekend, so I'm still hurting a little bit. Stay with me. The energy is low. I apologize. I promise you the big facts will still be there. Yeah, we went down to, to Nashville for, for the NFL draft. We drove 14 hours down there, 14 hours bike. What a weekend it was. I don't know if you guys saw like pictures on social media of how crazy it looked, but it was as crazy as the pictures looked. It was just nuts there the entire time. Such a fun weekend. The vlog for that, obviously we documented everything there. We'll be going out. If you're watching this on Wednesday, then it will be live tomorrow. So uh, that'll be a good one. Make sure you come back to the channel, check it out. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button if you enjoy the video. Now that the draft is done, we know where the rookies are. We know where everybody landed, free agency's done. So we know what the rosters are, are looking like here in the NFL. So we can start painting a picture of what the 2019 fantasy football season is gonna look like. So again, today we're gonna break down my top rookie running backs for the 2019 fantasy football season. We're going to talk a little season long. We're going to talk some dynasty, some rookie drafts, some of the obvious names, along with some kind of under the radar guys. Basically going to break each guy down, who they are as a prospect, who they are as a player, because some of you guys might not know who they are. And then based on their draft capital and where they were drafted, which team, their team fit and stuff like that, then break down what it looks like from more of a fantasy perspective. All right, I'm done talking. So let's get it. Real quick though, real quick dough, real quick dough. Now that the draft is done, you know, we could start getting a better feel for our rookie drafts, right? For those of y'all that are in Dynasty, I wanna know who your 101 is. Now that Josh Jacobs got picked in the first round, right? He's on the Raiders, he kinda owns that backfield. I'm hearing a lot of discussions, maybe him. I've even heard the name David Montgomery or Miles Sanders jump to the 101. Let me know down below who your 101 is in rookie drafts this year for your Dynasty League. Also, if you guys are interested in joining a Dynasty draft, we have partnered up with Flea Flicker as well as Team Stake to do paid leagues. Um, if you head over to patreon.com slash BDGE, you will be able to join Dynasty League startups that will start drafting in about a month or so um, with other members of the Big Dogs community. I will probably join myself into a couple of those Dynasty Leagues. So head over to patreon.com slash BDGE. Let's get to that first name. We have Josh Jacobs out of the University of Alabama. He was picked in the first round by the Raiders. Pick 24 overall. He was the only running back to go in the first round. Now, one thing that's so important when you're looking at these rookie running backs is to really look at these situations completely objectively because there's no other time of the year where you're really looking at game film, right? And each person is going to have their own wildly subjective opinion of a player. So it's really important to step back and be like, okay, I watched one game of this guy. I liked what I saw. That doesn't mean he's the next running back star in the NFL. You have to look at things from an analytical standpoint. You got to look at the numbers. You got to look at the athleticism, the production profile. You got to look at all of them together. And that's what I'm trying to do for y'all today. I don't think I could find a better example of, of what I'm talking about than Josh Jacobs out of Alabama. He had a counterpart named Damian Harris, who was drafted by the Patriots in this draft as well. And Josh Jacobs actually saw less work than Damian Harris did while the two were at Alabama together. These are his college numbers. He played three years at Alabama. There's not anything on this page that jumps out to you whatsoever. Josh Jacobs has never totaled more than 120 carries in a season three years at Alabama, while Damian Harris, his counterpart, had 135 or more targets in each of the three years that Josh Jacobs was at Alabama. His final season, when he jumped up from 46 carries in 2017 to 120 in 2018, you see his yards per carry number dropped, 6.2 down to 5.3. So when we're looking at Jacobs, almost everything that people are excited about is complete projection. We've never seen him handle a workhorse load. We've never seen him get a ton of receptions and we've never seen him be particularly efficient with a bigger workload. And his athletic measurables, his metrics from the pro day did not do him any favors. If you look at his college target share, 4.2%, which puts him in the 19th percentile for running backs. A 4.69 40 yard dash puts him in the 29th percentile for weight adjusted speed score. A poor, 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 homeless almost you could say. Burst score, 34th percentile. He didn't test for agility. He has that workhorse size though, 5'10", 220, which is something that a lot of the backs in this class lack. And I think that's why people got so excited for Josh Jacobs. And I'm somehow, somehow Josh Jacobs' best comparable player, despite the lack of production, despite everything, his best comparable player came out to Arian Foster on player profile. I'm not even sure how that happened, seeing as how 
Foster's college dominator was nearly double Jacobs's and his college target share was in the 86th percentile compared to Jacobs's who was in the 19th percentile. But regardless, when I see Aaron Foster pop up on there, I'm like, okay, you know what? We do have an example of a guy who lacked production, who lacked a few of these things that did end up being a great NFL player. So the, the precedent is, is set there. So it's possible that Josh Jacobs can be a, a great player. Jacobs on film is where he excels, right? There, there's no denying that from the big dog. The guy is explosive. The guy hits the hole hard. He can cut on a dime. He has the size. He has the quickness quickness to make a guy miss through power, through burst, through elusiveness, all the things that you want in in a pure runner, right? But, you, but again, you have to be very careful when it comes to subjective film analysis because you don't know who he's running against. You don't know the players that are trying to tackle him. They could be shitty players that shouldn't even be on the field. You know what I mean? So when it comes to film, I don't, I, I, I'm to the point where I don't give a shit. When people are on, on Twitter and they're posting like gifs of a guy that made a good play, like I don't care. Give me something objective so that I can put it in reference to the other things around. So for me, consistent production over a long period of time trumps everything when we're looking pre-draft analysis. However, you know, I like to break down the numbers. So I wanted to see what I saw on film, which was a very good running back. Did any of that translate into like concrete analytics and numbers? And, and they did. So looking at Pro Football Focus, this is just some stats from them. A whopping 41% of Jacobs' carries resulted in either a first down or a touchdown in 2018, which was the highest rate in the country. His .27 missed tackles forced per attempt tied for eighth in the NCAA among 62 draft eligible running backs, so eighth out of 62. And his 42.1% rate of not being tackled on first contact ranked fourth in the class. He scored above average in both pass blocking and yards per route run, but he also graded off the charts in Graham Barfield's yards created data on him. And y'all know I love Graham Barfield's Yards Created Data. You can go check that out at yardscreated.com. He does excellent work separating college running backs from their offensive line play to see how many, you know, just that yards they've actually created. So this is just a little picture and excerpt from from his, his Yards Created stuff. And this is basically just saying that their offensive line was out of control. Nothing we didn't know, right? Across the last four college football seasons, I've charted over 40 running backs that entered the NFL. In this time, no offensive line was more dominant than Alabama was last season. The tide opened up 1.81 yards on average when Jacobs carried the ball, which is the best figure I've ever charted. All told, Jacobs' .44 missed tackles per attempt ranks ninth best over the last four seasons and is in a similar class to Nick Chubb, Kareem Hunt, Sonny Michel, and Christian McCaffrey. The Tide sent Jacobs in motion on one quarter of his pass snaps and deployed him on a diverse route tree that included seams, goes, angle routes, out routes, and even curls when split out wide. Um, Jacobs averaged 2.4 receiving yards per route run in 2018, the second best clip in the 2019 running back class. So it basically back up, backs up what we're saying about the film is that he's really good when he's on the field. And you can see by the yards per route run numbers and them using him in motion and putting him around the field is that they have a lot of confidence in him in the receiving game. And he is actually quite effective. And, and you just watch the film and you can see that he is a natural pass catcher and he can absolutely be deployed in that sense of the game. Again, it goes back to me needing to see high level production with high volume over a consistent period of time. That's the thing that scares me about Jacobs is we don't know what's gonna happen if he gets a big workload, right? You're a first round rookie running back, you're supposed to get 250 touches. What happens when Jacobs gets that? We'll see, he has the size to get it, but for everyone that's like, he can handle it because of the size, we've never seen him handle that. So you're just saying that some guy on YouTube on Twitter is just saying he can handle it, doesn't mean that's facts. It ain't big facts there. Like I said, we're gonna break down the prospects and then we're gonna break down where they were drafted and what that means for fantasy. So. For draft spot slash capital for Jacobs, again, like I said, pick 24 overall to the Raiders. The only running back picked inside the top 52 picks of this entire draft. So clearly, you know, draft capital is so, so, so important when you're looking at rookie running backs. And for the most part, you kind of have to be picked within the top three rounds. Let me say it this way. In order for like us as fantasy players to have a, a decent projection of what we can expect from running backs... They, they pretty much have to be drafted within the first three rounds. If you're drafted outside of the first three rounds, of course, there is plenty of running backs that have succeeded outside of the first three rounds. But from us projecting who those are going to be, it, it's extremely difficult. The hit rate on guys in rounds four through seven or undrafted is like 6% of guys who would give, you know, a top 20 fantasy running back season at one point in their career. So it's very, 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 very difficult to project that. So Jacobs comes into Oakland. He becomes the immediate starter. There's a few other mediocre backs 
in in Oakland right now. They just inked Isaiah Crowell, so he's there. The pass catching back, Jalen Richard, is still in Oakland. They have the redundant DeAndre Washington. I don't even know why he's still there. The unnecessarily hyped Chris Warren, who runs like a fucking 4-8-40. Um, and then Doug Martin is not there anymore. Beast Mode is retiring, so rest in peace to Beast Mode. He's a savage. By the way, if you're wondering what this is, this is a, this is a shout-out to Tormund. Shout-out to... Everybody at Winterfell sacrificed their lives. This is giant milk, like Tormund. Giant titty milk, actually. But really getting into the numbers, guys. <clears throat> With Josh Jacobs, what I wanted to do is like, yes, when you're a first-round rookie running back, if you're picked in the first round, your path to touches is clear as day, right? There's nothing stopping you from seeing 250, 300, 350 touches. However, the numbers are a little bit different depending on where you're actually drafted. Over the last few years, we kind of assume this first round running back is going to get monster totals because we've seen Leonard Fournette, Christian McCaffrey, Saquon Barkley, Zeke are the ones that are being picked, but they're all like top five guys, top seven guys at worst, right? So there's no wonder that their overall touches are going to skew the entire first round rookie running back kind of argument. So what I did was using the Rotoviz screener app, I wanted to look at rookie running backs depending on where they were drafted. So I looked at top five, then from six to 10, and then 11 to 20, and then 21 to 32. Jacobs falls into that last category, right? Because he was picked from picks 21 to 32 at pick 24. So I looked back since 2000, 18, 19 years of sample size, and this is the average rookie season of that running back that was picked from picks 21 to 32. We have a 17 running back sample size, so that's a pretty good sizable amount. Their average touch count in that rookie year, 192 touches. 201 total opportunities, so carries plus targets, 5.9 total touchdowns, 33 targets, and looking at it from a fantasy perspective, RB27 in standard, RB27 in half PPR, RB31 in full PPR. Their average weight was 217, average height 5.9. So Jacobs is right around there. I think these are these are very, very, very realistic expectations for Jacobs, right? 225, maybe up to 250 touches. Decent involvement in the passing game, as you see, 33 targets was the average there. Jalen Richard is still there, and they trust him in the passing game. They used him a ton last year, and I don't think Jacobs is going to come in and play on every third down. I don't think he's going to be that guy. This offense won't be tremendous. I think 1,000 to 1,100 yards from scrimmage is absolutely realistic for Josh Jacobs. Five to seven total touchdowns. That's where I think people are going to get skewed. I think they're going to come in and, and assume that Jacobs is going to catch 40 balls, go for 1,300 yards, and score eight to 10 touchdowns. I think at the end of the year, we're looking at Jacobs having, I don't know, maybe six touchdowns, something around there. I, I kind of expect his ADP to hit somewhere around, you know, round four. And for me, that's that's way too high for my liking. Uh, I'll let him fall. If he falls to round five, I would start looking at him. Um, he's too unproven for me as a prospect. His production profile is not there. We have a quarterback that we don't really know what we're getting from. We, it's an offense that we don't trust, really. And it's an offense that wants to go pass heavy, given John Gruden is there. So in Dynasty, he absolutely enters a 101 conversation. But for me, he would be behind Nikhil Harry at the 102. And he would probably be my RB1 overall, though, in Dynasty. Because, again, the only running back picked in the first round. So that's my Josh Jacobs breakdown. I'm sorry. I know these are long. These are analytical. Y'all like when I when I drop the big facts on you. Um, so I will have the timestamps down below for any of these running backs if you just want to skip to certain guys. Next up on the list, actually, before before we get to the next guy on the list, make sure you drop that thumbs up button down below if you are enjoying the breakdowns thus far. We're going to get into more guys. We're going to get into Miles Sanders, David Montgomery, Daryl Henderson, and some other low-key guys that I really like. If you enjoy these prospect breakdowns, big dogs, we created a, a Rookie Dynasty draft guide for you guys this year. Uh, something that we didn't do last year. We only focused on season long, but the rookie guide is out right now. It is absolutely live. We're taking down the top like 65 to 70 prospects in depth, just like I did with Josh Jacobs, breaking down um, quarterbacks, wide receivers, running backs, tight ends, all the top prospects, their outlooks, where you should be targeting them in, in, in rookie drafts, in dynasty drafts, startups, and in season long drafts. There are exclusive articles that you're not going to get elsewhere. You get my dynasty rankings, my rookie rankings. This thing is going to be updated throughout the summer uh, to keep you intact for dynasty. And uh, a lot, yeah, a lot of the articles that are exclusive are, are, are pretty cool. Like I interviewed a lot of the top dynasty heads on Twitter, right? The people that are big in the industry. And I asked them like, what's your number one tip for people playing dynasty or starting dynasty? And uh, I have a whole bunch of, of their top tips. And then, you know, five new mistakes that a lot of new dynasty players make. Um, there are, there are going to be exclusive videos that aren't on YouTube, like, you know, mock drafts of a first round rookie draft or a full rookie draft, things like that. So, um, a lot of awesome content. If you are into dynasty, if you are into, you know, if, if you're doing rookie drafts right now, cause I know a lot of them start right after the NFL draft, you can grab that right now. 
BigDogsDraftGuide.com. Again, Big Dogs, B-I-G, D-O-G-S, DraftGuide.com. That will be linked down below. Go cop right now. You can get the season long. You can pre-order the season long for 20% off, but you can get the Rookie Dynasty Guide, which is live right now. Miles Sanders, what up? Philadelphia Eagle, former Penn State University, Nitty Lion. Goes in round two, pick 21, 53rd overall. Sanders has, uh, you know, steadily kind of crept up dynasty rankings over the last month or so, especially after the especially after the combine, which he kind of blew away. I'm sure you guys have kind of heard the story with Miles Sanders by now. He went to Penn State, but he was backing up Saquon Barkley for the first two years. So the lack of production over the first two years is literally, you couldn't find a better excuse for why you couldn't have production over the first two years. Your ass is sitting on the bench behind Saquon Barkley. That would happen to anyone in the world. Finally, his junior year after Saquon left, he steps in, rushes for 1,274 yards on 244 carries. Goes for over 1,400 total yards from scrimmage, nine total touchdowns. Yards from scrimmage ranked second in the Big Ten among running backs. So the production was absolutely there in the third season. Then it gets to draft time. It's got to run at the combine. The sixth fastest 40 time among running backs, 449. And of the running backs that actually ran faster than him, only Raquel Armstead, Rock Armstead out of Temple, weighs more than him. So his weight adjusted speed score in the 75th percentile is much more impressive than those guys that ran faster than him. He had the third fastest 20 yard shuttle and the fastest three cone time of any running backs there. So he's arguably the best all around back in this class. When you look at it from a size perspective, a speed uh, perspective, production profile, we saw him, you know, produce at a high level for an entire year. Um, Catching the ball, he had 24 catches last year, which is around the number I look for in a college running back to let me know that he can catch passes. His measurables are very good. He tested very well at the combine. So he's all around a great running back. He's shown the ability to produce on all three downs. It's very difficult to find an objective weakness when it comes to Miles Sanders. Again, I want to break down Graham Barfield's yards created. When I chart games for yards created, I classify missed tackles forced in three ways, power, speed, and elusiveness. Miles Sanders' 0.17 missed tackles via elusiveness is tied for eighth best since 2016. So Graham has, Graham started this in 2016. So he has basically four years of data leading up to, you know, all of these rookie classes and his yards created columns have produced ridiculously good and accurate and predictive results. He's someone who spotted Kareem Hunt, Alvin Kamara, all of these guys from very, very, very far back, right? A lot of people weren't high in them because they were a little bit later in the drafts, but he was all over these guys. And uh, I take what he says in yards created to the heart. Sanders has NFL caliber jump cuts, excellent company to be in too. So if you look at that list, Joe Mixon, Nick Chubb, Barkley, Hunt, McCaffrey, Dalvin Cook, Jacobs, Sanders. Missed tackles forced by elusiveness per attempt. Obviously, DeAndre Washington and Kenneth Dixon aren't necessarily great comps, but DeAndre Washington doesn't really have size, so they never really gave him a chance. Now, let's break down the draft spot, the draft capital. Sanders is the second running back off the board, right, in the entire NFL draft. He goes to Philly at pick 53. He is the only other running back besides Josh Jacobs to uh, to actually get picked within the first two rounds of the draft, which is actually a surprise because when you look at the last two years, there have been a combined total of 11 running backs picked within the first two rounds of the NFL draft. So that's on average five and a half a year. This year, it was only Josh Jacobs and it was only Miles Sanders. Now, his second round draft capital obviously does not guarantee success. First round doesn't get, his first round almost guarantees success just from a volume standpoint, but second round doesn't guarantee success. But there are a lot of good names when you look at second round running backs over the recent years. Le'Veon Bell, second round pick. Joe Mixon, Dalvin Cook, Carrion Johnson, Nick Chubb. But then we also have the Christine Michaels, Monte Balls, Gio Bernard, Bishop Sankey's, Amir Abdullah, Ronald Jones. So it's just a reminder that realistically you could talk yourself into any running back and that guy can turn into any one of these running backs. So I had Miles Sanders as my RB2 in rookie drafts and in dynasty, whatever for rookies. Um, behind Jacobs prior to the draft, and that remains the same. It's still Jacobs still, and then Sanders right after him. Sanders should step in and immediately compete with Jordan Howard for that starting role, if not take that over by the time camp starts. Howard was traded to the Eagles for a sixth round 2020 pick. Time is money, so that's even less valuable, right? A sixth round 2020 pick. Miles Sanders was just the second round pick for the Eagles in 2019. Howard has the size advantage, maybe, by a little bit, but other than that, I would say Sanders' game basically has the advantage on Howard in almost every aspect of it. He's a great all-around back. Harry Roseman is really excited about this guy, and I trust him when it comes to draft picks. I trust him when it comes to draft picks at the running back position specifically. One of the articles that kind of came out over the last couple days was Harry Roseman talking about Miles Sanders, and he said he reminds us of other guys in the backfield that we've had around here, and we really liked him. We really liked the chance for us to get him, you know, that early in the draft. And when he says that, I'm like, what guys is he thinking about? Because it ain't Corey Clemente, it ain't Wendell Smallwoods. So 
Philly, this is a tweet I saw somewhere on, on, on the Twatter sphere. Philly has drafted three running backs inside the top three rounds since Howard Roseman has been there since 2002. Three running backs within the first three rounds. Miles Sanders, 2019, LaShawn McCoy, and Brian Westbrook. You think those are the guys that he was saying remind him of Miles Sanders? Probably, considering the draft capital that they spent on those guys. I think he sees Miles Sanders as an all-around back that can catch passes. Look at McCoy, look at Westbrook. They were involved in every aspect of the game. So that's kind of the role I see for Miles Sanders. Am I worried this will be a committee? Yes, absolutely. I'm trying to be objective here. I know... um, with Doug Peterson there, they almost always use a running back by committee. I think that that might be the, the case in the in the beginning of the year, right? And we'll have to see if Darren Sproles returns because he will probably contribute in the passing game if he does. But he's like 39 years old. I don't I don't see what good that would do to come back. But Sanders' skill set makes nearly every other running back besides Jordan Howard on the roster redundant, right? Clement, Smallwood, Pumphrey, Josh Adams. Um, I, I'm sure they'll end up cutting one or two of those guys. There's no reason to have another back on the field other than Miles Sanders or Jordan Howard. I think Jordan Howard will be involved, but the touches that he's going to get probably aren't going to be valuable, right? He's going to be getting those grinding touches. Put your head down, run into the lineman, two yards, three yards, four yards. You don't care for those as a fantasy owner, right? You want the targets, which Sanders is going to get, and you want those explosive plays. You want the role that Sanders is going to have in this offense. And what makes Sanders, in my opinion, such a good pick in fantasy this year is that the casual fan, right? Most friends and family leagues... Or, you know, just I bet a lot of like sharp fantasy players will also think that, you know, having Jordan Howard there is going to ruin Miles Sanders' fantasy production, where I think Sanders is going to outright beat Jordan Howard for the starting role and, and the bigger portion of this backfield touches uh, by a good by a good portion, but they'll use Jordan Howard as a talking point, which will push Miles Sanders' ADP back probably until like the sixth-ish round, maybe the seventh round. Um, we'll have to see what happens come you know late August, early September. But I would ha- I would be happy to pull the trigger on on Sanders in you know in the sixth or seventh round there for sure. And like I said, he's my RB two in rookie drafts. He's an easy top five pick there that you can you might be able to grab around pick five. So big fan of Miles Sanders. Next up on the list, Darrell Henderson, Los Angeles Rams. Coming from the University of Memphis, round three, pick six in round three, 70th overall. They traded up to get him, the Rams did. Admittedly, admittedly, Daryl Henderson is not a guy I love when I watched him play. The holes that the linemen opened up were reminiscent of... You ever seen that one video on uh, on UG? You give someone with Darrell Henderson speed, right? 4.49 speed, sub 4.5 speed, holes like they did at Memphis, and he's going to break off monster plays. This is a tweet that I, that I put out last year, and I couldn't believe it when I was doing the research. In 2018, Darrell Henderson broke touchdown plays. These are just touchdown plays. He probably had other plays that he was tackled at the 10 or the 20 or whatever of 62 yards, 82, 62, 78, 59, 54, 61, 20, 54, 47, 43, 61, 25, 26, 71, 39, 60. Those were all touchdown plays, and those were all in 2018. That's not his college career. That was just in 2018. The guy is explosive. He hits home runs. At some point, I have to objectively look at this and say, fuck my film analysis. Look at the numbers. Holy shit. We know the college numbers are impressive. Arguably the most impressive we've seen in a long time, right? This final year at Memphis, 214 carries for 1,909 yards. Every time you're handing this guy the ball, he's giving you 8.9 yards, right? 8.9 yards per carry over a two-year span. That mark led the NCAA in both 2017 and 2018, as did his 1,909 rushing yards, as did his 22 rushing touchdowns, 25 total touchdowns, 2,200 yards from scrimmage, just a few more categories. He led the NCAA in in 2018. So what's not to like? Uh, My worry is that he is dependent on those big plays, and he made those happen thanks to the massive O-line holes. Another tweet from Graham Barfield. More specific to Henderson, Memphis's OL opened up 2.54 yards blocked every play, which is the most I've ever charted while doing yards created these last four years. And this was a tweet I saw after I watched film. Like the first thing I wrote down were like huge holes. Every time he ran the ball, the holes were fucking the size of this room. It's ridiculous. So if you have speed, of course, you're going to break off these big plays. 449 is fast, but it's not that fast in the NFL. At least like half the starting running backs in the NFL hit that number. Um, and that's fine. You don't need to have great straight line speed to excel as an NFL running back. But when you're 5'8", 208 pounds like Darrell Henderson is, you, you kind of do. So I wanted to look at some more numbers, some from PFF, Pro Football Focus, and some more from Graham Barfield. Darrell Henderson leads the 2019 running back class in yards created per attempt and yards per route run. Memphis also split him out as a wide receiver on 23 point, or 23% of his routes. Henderson ran through massive holes at times, but he has dynamic burst power quickness and is a versatile receiver. My RB2 behind Jacobs. When you look at the numbers from PFF, 
second in elusive rating, first in breakaway percentage, 14th in yards per route run, 11th in percentage of carries not tackled on first contact. He's a good passer, pass catcher too. He's not great, but consistent production all three seasons at Memphis. So that will check the box for any college back. Miserable pass blocker, um, but I'm not really concerned about that, to be honest with you, as long as Mike McCarthy is not the head coach and to the team he went to. So this is me acknowledging that I don't like him, particularly as a player, right? Like I, I think it goes back to creating on his own as a runner for me. And when I watched him, I didn't see that he was very elusive. I didn't see that he really made people miss their tackles, to be honest with you. He's not good at cutting, cutting laterally, moving from side to side. He's a straight up runner in my eyes. He has a narrow stance and he just he just runs very, I don't want to say stiff, but, but straight up. He's point A to point B. He can make some guys miss, but his elusiveness in space is mediocre among this class. When I look at it, the yards created that Graham charts, which he said Darrell Henderson led this class in yards created per attempt, can be created through speed, power, or elusiveness. And I'm willing to bet that the majority of his yards created were from speed and just those big breakaway plays. So I personally don't like backs like that at all. And I think you need to be in a really good situation. It's almost like it's like Tevin Coleman, right? Straight up back who needs big holes to fucking blast through them. However, 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 Darrell Henderson ends up on the Rams. You literally couldn't have found a better situation for him to end up in. And this was a lot, you know, I've said this for a couple of years now. Todd Gurley would not be putting up the numbers that he did without that offensive line. Most of his touchdowns come from within the 10-yard line, within the three-yard line, within the red zone, right? I think all 18 of his rushing touchdowns last year came within the red zone because he has monster, monster lines. So he goes to the Rams. They actually trade up for him. This this is tipping their hand. Uh, we've been talking about it all offseason. We have to be very, very, very worried about Todd Gurley's knee. This is a real thing. Like I said, Dr. Jesse Morris came on my channel about a month ago. He said the arthritis in Gurley's knee is very serious. It's not going anywhere and it's going to be a problem as he gets more and more touches. The Rams are clearly, clearly worried about it. They're saying Darrell Henderson is just a change of pace back for now. But like, if you look at the situation, they matched Malcolm Brown's offer sheet when, uh, who was it? Detroit, I think, tried to sign him. They matched it two years, $6 million. And then they traded up to use their third round pick on Darrell Henderson, the third running back off the board in this year's draft. If they had taking Darrell Henderson, you know, sixth round, fifth round, even fourth round, or any running back, I would say, okay, you know what? Like, Gurley's still definitely, definitely nothing to worry about there in terms of, like, competition. Third round, trading up for it in the beginning of the third round is pretty early draft capital. And it's true that Henderson won't make an impact immediately. You know, he'll be sitting behind Gurley, but you couldn't have put him in a place that's more similar to where he was at Memphis in terms of opening up these massive lines for him to just run through. And he should work wonders there given his breakaway ability, right? Like I said, I didn't like Henderson that much as a player, but this landing spot was his absolute ceiling. And I'm expecting Gurley's workload to decrease a little bit, right? They want to keep him healthy for a playoff run. And we saw how unhealthy he was for the playoffs this year. Um, if not, they're going to give him a ton of touches. And I think that knee is going to bother him and, and there are going to be a lot of issues there. So if something were to happen to Gurley this year, Darrell Henderson would step in. He will be the number two there. He'll step in and be a weekly top 15, if not top 12, if not higher than that, um, weekly fantasy back in that Rams backfield. It's going to depend on what happens with Gurley's health. But the fact of the matter is that there is a big issue there when it comes to Gurley's health. So Henderson probably won't be in my top three running backs when it comes to rookie drafts. He'll probably be closer to the end of the first round, maybe early second round, just because he goes into a backup role. Whereas the next guy, David Montgomery, drafted to the Chicago Bears, will probably step into the starting role immediately. This guy is fun to watch in open space. Not running the 40-yard dash, not fun to watch that, but he, at creating yards, he is fantastic. He's where a great producer meets miserable athletic measurables. And we knew Montgomery going into the combine was not a burner. He was going to have to test well to prove people wrong. No one went into it saying, oh, this guy has the breakaway speed, this guy can make long runs, whatever, whatever, whatever. He goes into the combine, runs a 4.63, 5'10", 222 pounds. So 47th percentile weight adjusted speed score, but his burst score was bad. All the testing was bad, but college dominator, college target share, all up there. And I have my concerns based on the 4.7 yards per carry that he had throughout college, which is not good for an NFL prospect, but their offensive line was miserable. He forced 100 missed tackles this year. Just this year, 100 missed tackles. That was the first time ever that a PFF graded running back has done that in a single season. He is ridiculous in open space, but the lack of breakaway plays is definitely concerning. He was picked in the third round by the Chicago Bears. Pick 73 overall, three spots behind Darrell Henderson. It was no secret that the, that the Bears were looking to draft their running back in this class. You know, they had brought in a ton of running backs pre-draft process to look at. And they had talked about that they wanted to draft a running back in the class. And I actually love this fit. 
I love this fit, but I need to sell myself more on Montgomery as a player, I think. Something I did talk about with Montgomery pre-draft a lot was it was important for him to land in an offense that ran out of the shotgun often, right? And basically, like, David Montgomery is an upgrade to Jordan Howard in that he's a great runner, but he also can catch the ball. And he's like a better version of Mike Davis, who they just signed as well. When I'm talking about he needs to run out of the shotgun more, th this is for a few reasons. It's because, like Le'Veon Bell, Montgomery can dance, man. Like he can really move them feet and make guys miss, but he has very little burst and he's not going to break off 20 yard runs, 30 yard runs, 60 yard runs. He will not hit the home run. Guys that have that long speed and that burst benefit tremendously from running from under center. Just think about it from a common sense standpoint. If the, the quarterback's under center and the running back's, you know, three, four, five yards behind him, he gets those initial two, three, four, five yards of, of running to use that burst to blast through the hole. But if you're David Montgomery and you don't have burst, that's not really effective. But if you're from the shotgun, right, you get the handoff there without a running start, you get to see the holes. You get to see the guys coming at you and create space on your own. And I think that plays to the benefit of a guy like David Montgomery who doesn't have burst, but has great quickness in his feet and great, you know, um, yards creating and, and elusiveness ability. So you want an offense that runs from the shotgun a lot and runs um, most of their plays from that formation. I made this chart for y'all. I did this a while ago, just basically the teams that needed to draft a running back in this draft. We look at the percentage of plays from shotgun and Chicago, 79%, second highest rate in the NFL. Their runs from the shotgun, you know, in terms of the percentage of the plays from shotgun that were run plays, 33% third highest in the NFL. So this is an absolute great landing spot. Great news for Montgomery as a player in terms of, you know, where he's getting the handoff from. And there is also this other random note, probably absolutely nothing is a reach here, but cool connection to note. Um, for one, obviously Matt Nagy is coming over from the Chiefs who coached Kareem Hunt. And he says he sees a lot of similar traits in the two. And I could see that They've, neither of them tested great, but they're both great in space, great balance contact and can make guys miss. The current recruiting director at Northwestern was the one that recruited David Montgomery to Iowa State. Also was the one who recruited Kareem Hunt to Toledo before him. So there's these weird connections there between Kareem Hunt and David Montgomery. The explosiveness, explosiveness absolutely still makes me nervous, right? His breakaway percentage last year was 31.2%, which was 63rd in the NCAA. Jordan Howard, who was also, you know, deemed pretty much like a big bruiser and, and kind of slow, ran a 4.5740 compared to David Montgomery's 4.6340. And when you look at the weight adjusted speed score, Howard's is in the 81st percentile. He had plenty of plays where he broke away 15 plus yards, 20 plus yards for Chicago. It's hard to predict that we see that with David Montgomery. Montgomery will compete with Mike Davis, who the Bears signed to a two year, $8 million contract this year. It was two years, six million or eight million, somewhere in that vicinity. Uh, but Montgomery is, is similarly built to Mike Davis and is better in the passing game and as a runner than Mike Davis is. So I don't really see a competition there. I think why they took him is because they don't want to rely, you know, it, it's so easy to see from a defensive standpoint. When you put Tyree Cohen on the field, they're gonna throw the ball. When you put Mike Davis on the field, they're gonna run, the, or Jordan Howard on the field, they're gonna run the ball. So they wanted a big back who was very versatile and that's exactly what David Montgomery is gonna be. So they're gonna be a very, very, very good duo. And it's a duo in which you're not gonna be able to telegraph the offensive plays. Cohen will still be very heavily involved, but I'm looking at him, you know, last year, 35% of his plays didn't even come from the backfield. He was either out wide or in the slot. So like this is going to be an R RBBC, but Montgomery should have plenty of games where he sees 18, 20 plus touches coming in both the passing game and the running game. Both of them can be on the field at the same time because Tariq Cohen is used all over the formation. The other thing to note is that it gets cold in Chicago towards the end of the year, man. Towards the end of the year, when they're playing that hard nosed NFC North football, 20 degree weather, we saw Jordan, Jordan Howard start getting those carry touches, you know, those, those those big workloads down the stretch last year when it gets cold. Montgomery is built for that man, 222 pounds. He is going to thrive down the stretch where a lot of running backs might struggle a little bit. So he becomes an intriguing early round draft pick in, in fantasy drafts. If you are an RB needy team going into your rookie draft this year, the NFL draft couldn't have played out better, right? If you have an early pick, I should say, because whereas pre-draft process, you love the wide receivers, all of them pretty much ended up in shitty landing spots. Um, the running backs were the opposite, right? You have David Montgomery in Chicago, you have Josh Jacobs in a complete open backfield in, in Oakland, and then you have Miles Sanders, who's in a little bit of a messier backfield, but it's still a very good offense, good offensive line. So a lot of good opportunities where running backs kind of jumped up. So he becomes an early to mid round rookie pick for me, probably in the 103 to 105 range. And in season long leagues, I'm probably looking at him. I'm not going to go crazy and, and start looking at him in the third, fourth round would probably be the earliest I would look at him, but like fourth, fifth round. So a lot of these running backs will be going in, in around the same area for me. But other than these top four guys, 
Jacob Sanders, Montgomery, and Henderson, there's not really a lot to love in terms of fantasy, in terms of landing spots and draft capital, right? There are only a couple other running backs picked within the top three rounds. Like I said, it's really important to, to get within that draft capital. It was Devin Singletary to Buffalo, round three, 74th overall. Damian Harris to New England, 87th overall. And then Alexander Madison, 102nd overall, last pick of the third round. Like, again, I echo to you guys, if you're outside of the top three rounds as a rookie running back, the path to touches and production is, is exponentially harder. And there will be guys who do it, but the hit rate is so low that it's naive to think you know which guys are going to do it. I had to break down some numbers for you. Looking back over the last 10 years, or I guess 11, right? Since 2008, we went back to 2008. There have been 39 running backs drafted in the fourth round overall, right? So 39 over the last 10, 11 years. I mean, of them, there are a few that have been awesome, of course, right? There's Demont Freeman, Lamar Miller, James White, Marlon Mack, Tariq Cohen. That's it though, those five. The other 34 running backs are either out of the league, never panned out, got hurt, whatever, which is 88% of those fourth round picks. So for every Lamar Miller that comes out of round four, you're looking at four Johnny Whites, Jamie Harpers, Gartell Johnsons, Jeremy Langfords, those kind of guys, some guys you've never even heard of. And there will be hype put on every rookie running back because that's how Twitter and that's how fantasy football works. Guys like the hype up guys who aren't good just so in case they break out, they get to claim those guys. But I just echo to you guys, the numbers, the percentages are not in your favor if you think that a fourth round running back is fantastic. It's 88% bust rate, right? So can you shoot your shot on your favorite guy? Of course, but temper expectations. The lower we go down in the rounds, the higher the bust rate is. So when drafting in rookie drafts, the entire first two rounds should basically only be used on guys that were drafted in the actual NFL draft within like the first three rounds. Let people who they think know something about a fifth, sixth round running back take him in the second round. Trust me, they, they don't know what they think they know. So let's break down those other round three running backs real quickly. We have Devin Singletary joins a messy backfield in Buffalo. I loved him on the field at FAU. Unbelievable elusive, elusiveness, actually very similar to Shady. Unfortunately, he measured in at 5'7", 203. So a very small back and a miserable athletic profile, uh, 4'6", 340, I think. So when you're that small, you need to have burst, agility, long speed in order to really have success. So very small in size. Um, and he caught six balls the last year he was at FAU. He did catch more in his previous seasons, but why do you only catch six balls in the, in the year that you're about to come out? It's very hard to see him ever carry a big workload in the NFL. He joins um, a backfield with TJ Yeldon, who they just signed, Frank Gore and LaShawn McCoy. It's very possible that LaShawn McCoy gets moved and or Frank Gore gets cut, which would obviously help the situation, but it's a little bit of a murky path to touches in an offense that we don't really know is going to be that good, which is probably not going to be that good. So for Singletary, he's probably an early third round rookie draft target for me. Damian Harris' pick really confuses me, to be honest. The Pats used their first-round pick on Sonny Michelle last year. And in my eyes, Michelle is a far, far superior back to Damian Harris in terms of being a runner. Now, Harris is a good prospect. I like him as a back, but Sonny Michelle is, is a much better, better runner. So it begs, begs the question, is Damian Harris just a pure depth pick? Probably not, because he was a third-round pick, which is pretty early for a running back. And he was like the fifth or fifth maybe running back off the board. Burkhead is signed through 2020. It would cost New England $2 million to cut him. So I don't think they're going to release him. It's, it's a bit confusing. Uh, I think it just speaks to the overall theory of New England. One, they value versatility more than they value, I think, the talent of a player. So Damian Harris can pass block. He can run the ball. He can uh, catch the ball. He can play on special teams. So I think they just saw an all-around good prospect. They probably valued him more than a lot of other teams did on their board. And they saw an opportunity to jump up for him because they had three third-round picks. Whatever. I don't see Harris really getting into the lineup and, and producing on a high level of fantasy production, especially not this year. Obviously, if Sonny Michel or Rex Burkhead gets hurt, which is definitely possible because they've dealt with injuries, Harris can get on the field, of course. He's someone that I probably would look at in, in like the third round of rookie rookie drafts. Then you have Alexander Madison out of Boise State. He goes to Minnesota. He's going to be a backup to Dalvin Cook. Latavius Murray signed in New Orleans, so he should step in as the number two. And I absolutely love this pick for Dalvin Cook, not for the Vikings or for Alexander Madison. As someone who is going to be heavily invested in Dalvin Cook this year, I was worried that they take a back early or an earlier back or someone who I think could actually threaten Dalvin Cook. Madison ain't that guy. I think guys who watch tape and guys who just look at the overall numbers of what Madison did in college love him, uh, but that they're not valuing him from a fantasy perspective correctly, in my opinion. When you look at the overall numbers, you are going to be impressed, right? 1,415 rushing yards in 2018, ranked eighth in the NCAA, 302 carries, big workload, 17 rushing touchdowns. And he has size too, 5'11", 221 pounds, something that a lot of the top backs in this year's class lack. That size gave him the uh, ability to handle monster workloads. Last year down the stretch, their last two games, he, he's out of Boise State, I apologize. Their last two games, Boise State's versus Utah State and versus Fresno State, State. Madison carried the ball 37 times for 200 yards, three touchdowns versus just Utah State. Their last game versus Fresno State, 
40 carries for 200 yards. So 37 carries, then 40 carries, 200 yards in both of those games. Ridiculous volume. He's also a good pass catcher. 28 catches as a sophomore, another 27 in 2018. But at the end of the day, who he is as a plotter, who he is, is a plotter, right? That's, that's, but he averaged 4.7 yards per carry at Boise State against lesser competition. Really bad. And what's worse is he ran a 4, 6, 7, 40 yard dash. That just, that just ain't it. He lacks explosiveness. He had just nine carries last year go for 15 plus yards out of 302 total carries. That's 2.9% of his carries going for 15 or more yards. When you have other guys like Josh Jacobs, who was an explosive player and had a lot of his carries go for more. Um, I just think this guy is like a, a poor man's version of David Montgomery. Uh, maybe like an Alex Jones or a Jay Jai with a little bit better passing skills or a Doug Martin who lacks speed and explosion. So it's all like poor man's versions of guys. He's missing parts of the game. He's really just a one down, two down plotter. And maybe they'll use him on the goal line. We'll have to see. That could be the only hit to a guy like Dalvin Cook. Not high whatsoever on Madison. He's probably a guy we look at again in the third-ish, late third round of rookie drafts. So that wraps up the top three rounds of running backs. We had some other guys that I want to point out that I like. Let me bring up a list of the running backs on here and guys that kind of jump out to me. Bryce Love was an interesting pick. I don't really want to get too into him because I, I, we don't even know if he's going to play this year. It might be a future pick to fill into that Chris Thompson role once he's gone after 2019, but I don't see him making any sort of impact in 20 in 2019, especially with Darius guys there. A couple guys I do love. I love the landing spot for Justice Hill. Um, they don't have explosive playmakers on that offense, right? They have Mark Ingram, Gus Edwards in that backfield. Justice Hill should step in and get a handful of carries as well as a lot of passing work there. So um, I absolutely love Justice Hill in rookie drafts this year. If you can get him a little bit later, he tests a great 4-4, four, 40-yard four, um, speed. Justice Hill is my favorite fourth rounder here. I like these back-to-back -back picks of uh, Rock Armstead to Jacksonville out of Temple. He was a guy I liked, especially when I saw him on film. He's a bigger guy with good weight adjusted speed score. So he's got um, good long speed and that's just like who they have now, Leonard Fournette, who's probably going to get hurt again this year. So if he goes down, I like Rock to kind of step in and, and be a low-key good fantasy producer this year. So he's someone I'll be targeting at the end of rookie drafts, as well as Quadri Allison from Pittsburgh. He goes to the Falcons. I knew we were going to take a running back this year. I was expecting, I was actually expecting it to be Damian Harris. And I still feel like it probably was going to be if the Patriots didn't take him. Quadri Allison has Big size and good speed. 6'1", 225 ish, around there. Edo Smith's gonna be the pass catching back, I think. Devonta Freeman, who I also think has a very high risk of injury, will be like the early down grinder this year. And I think Quadri Allison has a chance to really step in there and, and make an impact in the rookie year. And he's someone who's probably gonna go very possibly undrafted in rookie drafts because people don't really know his name. And I don't really know his name before he was picked, but he ran a 4.5840 at 228 pounds, which is 76th percentile weight adjusted speed score. He put up good numbers in college. I actually really like this guy. When I watched his film, he looked very quick footed and I like to see that in a bigger player. He was interesting. The rest of the guys, I don't know what the fuck the Bengals were doing, drafting Travion Williams and then Rondy Anderson in the sixth round. But again, guys, if these guys fall, I know a lot of you guys are going to be like, Rondy Anderson, oh, big steal, big steal, whatever. He's fucking the end of the sixth round. He should have been in the seventh round because of compensatory picks. That is so, so far down the draft board. They pick, they... For those of you guys that are going to hype up Rodney Anderson, they literally pick the running back before they pick Rodney Anderson. They like Trayvon Williams more. It was probably a Geo replacement, but I, I don't know. That was weird picks for me. The only other guy I like left on the draft board, Darwin Thompson. I absolutely love Darwin Thompson. He reminds me so much of Tariq Cohen. And when I did my write-up for him, the pre-draft write-up, this is before the draft happened, in the Rookie Dynasty Guide that's for sale, bigdogsdraftguide.com, I literally pinpointed it. I, have, I had him going to the Chiefs in the sixth round because you didn't have to spend a lot of draft capital on him, but he is like Tariq Cohen, which worries me a little bit for Damian Williams because I think Darwin Thompson is going to work his way into a pass-catching role there. He's explosive. He is shifty. He is Tariq Cohen. Maybe a little less quick in terms of like lateral agility, but he is a better runner and he's way more powerful than Tariq Cohen is. So that in the Chiefs offense, I will take all of that in the fourth round of rookie draft. You might not even have to draft him because he went in the sixth round. You might be able to pick him up after your rookie draft. So Darwin Thompson is absolutely a name to keep an eye on. And that's probably the only other running back I really like. We'll have to see what other free agents kind of start getting picked up. But again, guys, the later they go in drafts, the less likely they are to really make an impact on the team. Also, if you guys are interested in joining a dynasty draft, we have partnered up with Flea Flicker as well as Team Steak to do paid leagues. Um, if you head over to patreon.com slash BDGE, you will be able to join Dynasty League startups that will start drafting in about a month or so um, with other members of the Big Dogs community. I will probably join myself into a couple of those Dynasty Leagues. So head over to patreon.com slash BDGE. Make sure you check out the Rookie Dynasty Guide if you're getting prepped for your leagues. BigDogsDraftGuide.com. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button down below if you enjoyed. Make sure you share this shit with your friends. I know you guys don't want to share it with your league mates, but whatever, whatever, whatever. Drop that comment down below. Who is your 101? Subscribe to the channel if you're new, and I will see y'all on, well, watch the vlog tomorrow of the Nashville Draft Weekend. Friday will be the, this uh, video like this, similar to it, but with wide receivers. So that's all I got for y'all today. I love you. Bye.
Audio Jump.